Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Teleview 85. It's an 85mm f7 600mm focal length apochromatic refractor. Now the TV85 has always been a popular choice for those looking for a premium refractor from Teleview, and this sits in the sweet spot in their line, I think. It's not too big, it's not too small. Yes, it's expensive, but wait until you see the models that are bigger than this one, they are stratospherically priced. Now I've owned two Teleview 85s in my lifetime. I have sold both of them and I regretted it both times. So it's good to make the acquaintance of one of these things again. I actually haven't seen one of these things in a while. This was a sample sent to me by Teleview. Thank you very much, Teleview. So let's take a look. Okay, so here we are with a Teleview 85 in its case, and I will first point out the only thing that has gone wrong in this entire review. The zipper on the left-hand side is broken. It doesn't work. So this is a review sample, so we'll go ahead and chalk it up to that situation. Open it up, you get the familiar Teleview 85 instruction manual, wishing you clear skies, Al Nagler. So I do want to point out that if you buy this, your $2,160 or thereabouts just buys you the case and the optical tube. The rest of this is on you. Let's take a look at this real quick, as familiar drilled focusing knob on Teleview. It's a Teleview 85. Look on the other side and we have it. It is a Teleview demonstrator. Hmm, apparently this is one they send out to people like me. 10 to 1 fine focuser and a really beautiful smooth focuser as is typical with Teleview. Might wish for some graded markings here. You're starting to see that even on some mid-grade refractors these days. So open up the cap here. You get beautiful deep dark rich coatings and a dew shield. So again, um, Whenever I get a nice refractor in here, people always seem to ask, is this thing for sale? Like, will they sell it? Uh, no, it's a demonstrator. You can't have this one. It's going back to Teleview. Well, okay, so if you're an old hand at this, you probably are fine with just getting a bare optical tube. If you're a beginner, you're probably going to want to get some other materials with it. And when you're doing this as a beginner, there's a lot that you have to buy. And sometimes people get stymied by this. I'm running into this a lot. So if you are a beginner, the quickest way to get all of the accessories you need is to buy the accessory package. That $650 or so buys you the tube ring, the inch and a quarter to two inch adapter, the two inch diagonal, and an 18.2 millimeter D-Lite eyepiece. So here's the tube ring here. And you see I've already mounted it on something. Now, when you do buy this, you don't actually get everything you need. You actually have to get a finder. So I've got this Teleview quick point finder on here. Um, you know, this is okay. It's a modified Daisy gun sight. It's made of plastic. It's functional, but on the other hand, it is far from the build quality of everything else that you see here. Now they do make a nicer red dot finder. It is called a star beam. It is quite a bit more expensive. I've always thought maybe there's some room for, uh, you know, something in between, perhaps a Teleview 80 or $90 red dot finder wouldn't be out of the question. So if you do get their tube ring, this thing has been around since, I don't know, since the beginning of time. And it's okay, it'll work, but it does kind of lock you into their system at least a little bit. These grooves and these mounting centers here are built for Teleview finders, as is the hole spacing on the bottom. You can see I've already got a plate on there. Now hopefully they want you to use the tube ring on their Gibraltar mount. That's their Altaz mount. But if you want to put it on something else, you've got to figure out a way to get it on a plate. And right now, there aren't a lot of plate options that have this hole spacing on it. This is an Astrophysics AP sliding bar 7-inch version. It is drilled for Teleview spacing like this. I do want to point out, if you do get the Astrophysics plate, the Vixen style dovetail plate is actually a little wider than this one. The AP plate is slightly narrower. You do want to make sure that whatever clamping mechanism you have has enough travel to actually engage the plate itself. I really don't want to hear about telescopes falling off mounts. You may also be able to get a plate through scope stuff, and so they occasionally will have plates and rings of various sizes. Check their inventory because it does change fairly regularly. Okay, so as you can see, Teleview did send me the entire accessory kit. You can see I have mounted the tube ring on the tube. This is the two inch 
Everbright diagonal. This, along with the Astrophysics Maxbright, is my favorite two-inch diagonal of all time. You have the normal Teleview two-inch to inch and a quarter hi-hat adapter here, and the 18 millimeter, 18.2 millimeter D-Light eyepiece. This is a fantastic eyepiece. I have been using this for a couple of months now, and I could tell you uh, it's so good that it's starting to make me question my loyalty to the 19 millimeter Panoptic. For one thing, it has a 20 millimeter eye relief figure, which is important if you wear glasses, which I sometimes do when I'm observing. The 19 millimeter Panoptic is quite a bit tighter. This goes in here like this. Now, if you do, uh, if you're a veteran to all of this, you probably don't need the accessory kit. You've probably got your own stuff going on, but I will point out that for an 85 millimeter refractor, the optical tube actually has a three inch diameter, which is fairly common. In fact, I brought these out. I've had these for a very long time. These are some cheap three inch mounting rings I got from Orion. These things cost next to nothing. Those will go around the optical tube. And on the bottom, there are mounting holes. You can just get any old plate. I've got lots of these things. You can see I've drilled lots of holes and you could do it yourself this way. There are no right or wrong ways to do this. There's whatever happens to work for you. I put this on here, I put an auto guider on the front. There are holes at the top. You can mount a finder or other accessories. Again, there's no right or wrong way to, right or wrong way to do this. Just do what works for you. So as you can see, I've got it here in full Teleview garb here with their clamshell ring, their diagonal, and their eyepiece. That's the way I think Teleview would like to see me use this thing. The star test on this telescope is outstanding. Nothing to talk about, identical patterns inside and outside of focus, even at very high magnification. As with any first-rate refractor, the contrast is outstanding. For example, on the Galaxy M33, a notoriously difficult object for beginners, it does show up fairly reasonably even at low power. I had this thing compared to a Celestron C5, that's a 5-inch Schmidt Cassegrain, and while the C5 did get M33, this one I felt was a little bit better because of the superior contrast. Nothing wrong with the C5, you should get one of those. I like those telescopes a lot. But this is what refractors do best. Deep, dark, rich contrast with pinpoint diamond on velvet stars. Here is late fall as we're doing this right now. It's an unusually warm fall, so we've been out here quite a bit, and looking at the objects in and around Cygnus is very entertaining. The Veil Nebula, for example, with an O3 filter is just fantastic, as is the dumbbell and the ring. Sagittarius is setting in the west, and the Lagoon Nebula, by the way, here's a trick. If you have an O3 filter, use it on a good refractor on the Lagoon Nebula. It works very, very well, as it does on the Swan Nebula. Deep sky objects are terrific. Again, M13 in Hercules setting in the west, just enough granularity on the outside so that you can start to resolve some of the outer members. Of course, if you want to resolve more members, you do have to have more aperture. Refractors excel on the moon and on planets. And on the moon, it's terrific. On Saturn, in moments of good seeing, you can just keep pumping the magnification up. As with any good refractor, it almost seems like a sponge to absorb magnification. It has that reach out and touch it sort of quality. I've shown Saturn to some people out here now, and they've said it almost doesn't look real when it's in the eyepiece. So Teleview did also send me this in the package. It's their field flattener and reducer. This is a 0.8 reducer. And I've been meaning to play with this thing for quite some time. If you followed my channel, you know that I've been in search of a good two inch field flattener for quite some time. That Astrotech field flattener, good for the money, but not quite up to snuff on a really nice refractor. So let's go ahead and set this down here. And it just goes into the focuser like this. So, you know, you don't see a lot of deep sky images taken with Teleview 85s, and I don't really know why that is. I have had people tell me in the past that the TV 85 is somewhat less well color corrected outside of the visible spectrum, which could result in some smearing when you're looking at it in imaging. Now, if that's the case, I'm telling you, I didn't notice anything here, at least the way that I do imaging. This is a full-spectrum Hutech modded EOS 5D Mark III, again with the field flattener attached, and 
I didn't really notice anything, but again, yeah, there are many different ways to do deep sky photography. The way that you do it, you may wind up showing something up that I didn't see here. I can't comment on that because I don't shoot monochrome LRGB and all that stuff that you guys do with the filters. So go ahead and take a look at some of these images here. Now, especially in that area around Cygnus, that is the Veil, the 6992, and both the 6960 portions of the Veil, the North America, the Crescent, and the Dumbbell. Now you'll notice if there were anything going on strange there, you would tend to see stars either being bloated or stars with chromatic aberration or stars that weren't quite pinpoints. And I'm not seeing any of that there. In fact, there's a lot of stars in those images and they are quite small. Taking images towards the west, you can see the lagoon and the Swan Nebulas, I'm not really noticing anything there. Now with the field flattener in place, you w I do wanna point this out, it does not fill the frame of a full frame sensor. This is a integrated image in Pix Insight, and as you can see, the edges are darkened there. This is common with a field flattener that is also a reducer. Having said that, what's inside that usable field is of outstanding quality. So once you're inside the non-darkened areas, it looks fantastic. And I found I could use almost all of what was inside that area. Now, again, if you're using an APS-C sensor, you're gonna find that you're gonna use even more of that field. Now, as another example, Let's take a look at a Teleview Pronto. This is from the review I did about a year ago. On the veil, now this is not a scientific test. They were taken a year apart and the field flatteners were different and you know, sorts of other variables in play here. But you can get an idea of what one generation's worth of optical design has done. Pronto, a very good telescope for its time, and still you see those things in service today but you can start to see that the stars are a little bit purple on the outside. The Teleview 85 is completely clean. So like I say, it's been an unusually warm fall here, but this is Southern New Hampshire. And as a famous philosopher once said, winter is coming. So uh, when that does happen, I'm really looking forward to looking at the winter objects. I'm sure I'm going to be having a terrific time with this thing on the Orion Nebula, on the Pleiades, the double clusters, and all of those open clusters in Auriga and in Gemini. So I don't know how long Teleview is going to let me keep this thing, but I'm going to keep it for as long as they let me. Okay, do we have any concerns here? Well, yes, perhaps a couple of minor ones that I've mentioned already. I wish the focuser did have markings on it so I could find my position again. And I would wish for a finder in between the $40 one and the $300 one. Some people have also questioned whether the clamshell is getting outdated at this point. I know it's a huge tradition, but perhaps they could give us an option for spaced rings and a plate like everybody else. The other thing about the Teleview 85, as with any premium refractor, the white elephants in the room, the cost, and the aperture. So I don't know what to tell you at this point. I think by now people just kind of accept this. You're going to be giving up those two things to get the views through a nice refractor. As far as the aperture goes, you can always supplement this with something else. And in fact, I find almost everybody does that. It's pretty rare, I think, to see somebody who just owns a Teleview 85. They almost always have something else, and that something else is almost always much larger. You can supplement this with an 8 or 10 inch Dobsonian or an 8 inch Metcassegrain. That way you've got all your bases covered, and there's no question as to what you take out on any particular night. I also found myself impressed with this. This is the field flattener. I just may wind up picking one of, up one of these. I need one of these. So there you have it. It's a look at the Teleview 85. Again, a very popular choice for astronomers looking for a premium apochromatic refractor in the three to four inch aperture range. I hope this review has helped you decide if this telescope is right for you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.